Peace be with you. I'm Pastor Stephen Jurdy at Zion and Bethany Lutheran Churches, and this is your word at the middle of the week. We are studying the book of Revelation, an excellent book for Christmas time. People may not think so, because we think of Christmas as cozy and togetherness and sweet baby Jesus, and it is all that. And, and that's a good thing. People have to sometimes criticize that, but they shouldn't. It's a good thing. Uh, and we think of Revelation as big and scary and apocalyptically out of this world. And uh, how do those two fit together? Surely they don't, but they do, because they are both about the appearing of Jesus Christ in human history and turning this cosmos, this creation, into his habitation, which is also something we don't always think about, because we think of God being outside of creation and far away from us, and he's not. In Jesus Christ, he has drawn near, as he said at the beginning of his ministry, the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent and believe the good news. We are waiting for Pastor Johnson to join us, and when he does, then we will jump into the rest of chapter 14, I believe. There he is. Boom. And Pastor Johnson is being added. Like a numbered goal of instant revelation. Hello, Pastor Johnson. How are you? Good, good morning, Pastor Jordy. I am well. Yourself, sir? I'm good. Thank you very much. I was just someone, a, a, a family friend from back where I grew up, uh, commented uh, about my grandmother uh, on one of our other videos here. Uh, I don't know if it was last night or this morning. And it made me remember that today is the 25th anniversary of my grandmother Nelson's last Bible study that she ever led. She was 92 years old. She was 92 years old. She died 25 years ago tomorrow, I believe. I believe that would have been 25 years. 1996, right? That's 25 years. And, um, and the day before, she led a Bible study at Bethlehem Lutheran Church, <coughs> excuse me, in Morris, Illinois. She was 92 years old when she <laughs> did that. So um, that's amazing. just kind of, kind of interesting to think about that and to remember that. So we are in chapter 14, aren't we? Yes, yeah, we, take, we took a look, a uh, brief look at the 144,000 uh, in the first five verses there, six first five verses. And so we concluded at verse five, and I believe we pick up uh, at verse six, unless you wanted to rehearse anything or rehash anything from the beginning of chapter 14. No, I, well, well, just to remind folks, because people, you know, join us, you know, like, like any other event, you know, not always consistently week to week. So in case people are just joining us, um, just a reminder of 144,000. Uh, it's not, that, that is a number that is um, an encrypted promise to the people of God. We've talked about it a lot, but just in case others have not heard it. Uh, 144, of course, is um, 12 times 12. So that's the the number of the Old Testament people and the New Testament apostles multiplied by each other and then multiplied by a thousand, which means a really, really big number. So the full <laughs> number of saints, the full number of saints, 144,000, uh, both those of, of the Jews and those of the Gentiles, those of the Old and those of the New Testament are, will be saved. God will save the full number of his people and will not lose any of them. And that's very good news. So, um, you know, in verse four, these have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the lamb and in their mouth no lie was found for they are blameless. Um, first fruits is a term applied to Christ only in first Corinthians 15. He is the first fruits of the resurrection. Now we see it applied also to his people. They are the first fruits. He's the first fruits for the Father. We are the first fruits for the Father and the Lamb. And so um, good to know that the union of God and his people is that tight, that the same appellations can be applied, the same names and titles can be applied to God's people. We're never called the Savior. We're never called uh, the Lord, of course, we're never called God. We are not those things. And it'd be interesting study to, to see which ones are applied to us and which ones aren't. But, uh, but we are called other names of Christ, light, 
uh, temple and your first fruits. So that's all very good news. And then also at the very end there in chat in verse five, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Uh, the blamelessness that we are granted is the blamelessness of Christ who purifies us and our speech, so that when people come looking for our sins on the last day, and even now, if people were, were to go into heaven looking for a record of our sins, they would not find one because Christ has abolished the record against us. Thanks be to God. That brings us to verse six. So why don't you read verses six through 13, Pastor? Sure. All right, let us begin. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second, followed saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest. Day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever received the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead, who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. This is some of the language that I think it's fair to say frightens people when they read it in Revelation. It makes them uh, tremble at the thought of God's wrath. And, and yet it's, it's language that we find in the Old Testament too. I mean, it's not new language. Um, this language in particular, verses nine and following, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Uh, the cup of God's wrath is an image we find in the prophets. Uh, he will pour out the cup of his wrath. His people will drink the cup of his wrath. And it's a, it's a, it's a pregnant image because, of course, cup and wine are associated with feasting and God's blessing throughout Holy Scripture. Uh, this is the promise of the promised land, that in the promised land, you'll have cups full of wine because of the part of the promised land's promise is that there will be vine vineyards and vines that are full and rich in Israel. And so the cup uh, of wine is, a, is an image of fullness and harvest. And then in the New Testament is the Lord's blood at Holy Communion. But here now, we're, to we're basically, what we're being told is, uh, if you fall into the worship of the Antichrist, you will also then participate in the Anti-Supper. Uh, you will, although maybe that doesn't quite work. I mean, the Antichrist probably does have an Anti-Supper. That's something to think about. But this is, this is actually one of God's suppers, but it's the Supper of His wrath. So rather than the, than the Supper of Salvation, you receive the Supper of, of wrath. The drink of wrath. So it, it's simply language that is uh, employed to to preach God's judgment. 
and, and in a way that sh that shows that kind of emphasizes the loss of the blessing that now the cup we're given would be turned from the cup of blessing into the cup of wrath should we worship a false god mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts you had on that i mean there's lots more we can talk about here but just anything that you're, you're is percolating yeah. in our mind that was an initial thought mine as yeah. we read yeah well like, like you mentioned that that image of the cup it is indeed a pregnant image um like you mentioned also hearkening back to the the messianic banquet where there will be much food and wine and grain um that it'll be a, a quite a celebration but also the prophets do time and time again talk about that cup of wrath and we hear a little bit uh, and i kind of wonder if this is what jesus is talking about as he's in the garden of gethsemane when he says father let this cup pass from me um you know is that the cup of wrath that jesus is imbibing as it as it were um, on behalf of sinful humanity um, and so again, just a very, uh, like you said, a pregnant image um, steeped in Old Testament scripture and a promise uh, for those who, who refuse to uh, come to faith in Jesus and would rather worship the lamb. Um, and that, that anti-supper is a really interesting image too, like you mentioned, because in, in chapter 13, uh, a part of what designates someone who's got the mark of the beast is that they are allowed uh, to buy and sell, right? Um, those who don't have the mark, those right. who are marked instead of by Christ, they, they, they can't buy and sell. Well, what are they going to buy and sell? Well, of course, most in those days, people would mostly buy food. Um, and so, I, you know, that that's it's a really interesting observation, the anti-supper. And I wonder if chapter 13, you could you could tie into that uh, that as well. Well, I would. Absolutely. And then also verse 8, yeah. uh, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of her passion, of her sexual immorality. Um, you know, part of the anti-supper um, that is associated with Rome here, I mean, if we think of, of Babylon the great as language for Rome, which Rome, we talked about this, maybe not last time, the time before, Rome is the, is the governmental tyranny that the early Christians knew when this prophecy is first given, and it continues to stand for all tyrannies that might um, tyrannize the church, uh, whether governmental or other tyrannies of a more or less self-imposed nature even. But what is particularly known about the ancient world then is that their, their uh, wine suppers their wine feasts could turn into sexually immoral feasts into orgiastic events and so um you know there's a there's a there's a definite line being drawn here between pagan society and and christian life and drunkenness and sexual immorality are being used to describe it for uh, mm -hmm. the early christians and then also for us today so no, there, there's probably part of the anti-suffer as well, simply the, the anti-life. If you think of all of life ultimately as a feast, all of our life revolves around eating, around the table. We work for the sake of the table. We build homes for the sake of the table. We build families for the sake of the table and table sustains families so that all of life is ultimately a feast. There's the anti-suffer, there's the anti-life as well as the anti-Christ. Mm -hmm. And the anti-life is a life of um, licentiousness, as we're told throughout the New Testament, a life of, of immorality, a life of, of drunkenness and slumber, a spiritual slumber away from, from Christ. Mm -hmm. So also, I did want to pass over the fact in verse, excuse me, in verse 10, uh, this comment, he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Uh, this is language from Christ in the Gospels. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father in heaven. And there's also reference there in the Gospels to, to, be, to confessing those who confess Christ being acknowledged in the presence of the angels 
which then the implication is those who don't are, are denied in the presence of the angels. The angels always show up at the time of judgment as the messengers and doers of God's will. And so this is actually recalling in not only the Old Testament prophets, but also the New Testament word of Christ in the Gospels. And it, and it, mm -hmm. it doesn't it, um, doesn't it emphasize for us all the more that we want to know, we want to be, we want to maybe revisit the beast and the mark. You know, who, who is the beast? What is the mark, Pastor Johnson? Uh, since this is such a terrible thing to fall into, according to this passage. Right, yeah, we, we heard earlier in chapter 13 about the two beasts, uh, the one beast who came out of the sea, and then the second beast who comes out of the earth. Um, and the first beast right. seems to be associated with, with the dragon that we hear about, uh, the, the image of Satan in chapter 12. And this, this first beast Serpent. and the second beast, in a way, they, they, tr they try to imitate um, and ape uh, the lamb in, in their appearance, but what comes out of their mouths is blasphemy. And so to be marked by the, these beasts, the first beast and the second beast, is to uh, be connected, to, to swear allegiance uh, to ultimately to Satan, to the, to the work of, of the devil. Um, and that, that, that there's always that allure of what is evil um, that, that marks the sinner. You know, like you, you mentioned the, the feasts um, and, you know, no doubt in pagan society, it looks like a lot of fun to go to these feasts, right? People are having all sorts of fun. There's laughing, there's enjoyment, they're getting smashed, they're drinking way too much, they're having lots of fun. And then of course they engage into lewd behavior. And on the outside, uh, to, to many, uh, to the unconverted, that looks like a whole lot of fun and they want to get part of that. Um, but that really, in God's eyes, that marks them as someone who really is lost, right? Um, that they, they are marked not by the, by, the, by the blood and the righteousness of Jesus. Uh, they're not marked by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they have the mark of, of another God, the, the prince of this world, as St. As Paul would say. Um, and it kind of goes to what, what Luther, Martin Luther said a number of years ago. Um, you know, he famously said that we, we all are like an ass, a, a donkey. Uh, we are either being ridden by God or be, we're being ridden by Satan. And there's really no middle ground here, right? It's, it's, it, there's a, there's a, uh, a division that happens um, because of Jesus. And those who don't follow Jesus will have that mark of the beast. Whether they know it or not, of course, is another story. Um, but that is how, through the eyes of, of, of God, that's how they are viewed as those who are marked, not by Christ, but marked by the beast. And um, maybe some of that imagery is also tied to um, uh, tattooing in the ancient world. Maybe that's part of it, too. Uh, Romans would have tattoos, and um, especially those who served in the military. Uh, I don't know. I'm just kind of throwing that out there. But... Um, it, 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 is a, it is a public distinction of those who are marked by Jesus and those who are marked by the beast, that there's something visibly different uh, that, that, that John is drawing our attention to, I think. And we don't want to forget that, you know, part of what they're experiencing as Christians when they hear this um, originally is that the emperor of Rome demands allegiance as to a god. And so it's, it's idolatry, you know, idolatry is the very first commandment um, and remains sort of the, the abiding sin that God hates, seems to hate the most, like in the Old Testament, right? Um, it's always mm -hmm. the false worship of Baal and Asherah. But, um, but it's interesting that in the New Testament, idolatry and sexual immorality are often associated with each other as though one will quickly follow upon the other. In, in particular, sexual immorality will follow quickly upon idolatry. This is a point made by St. Paul in the book of Romans in the first chapter. And really it's made by St. Paul frequently throughout his letters because he always associates sexual immorality with um, false worship or false belief. 
in his lists of the works of the flesh. Um, and, and then, of course, here as well in, in Revelation. And so it kind of begs the question, you know, for, for our own sake, to think through what that connection is. What is the connection between idolatry and sexual immorality? Why should, why should they be so closely related to each other? And I think there's a couple of different ways that one can go at that. First of all, when we remember that the, the heart of idolatry, uh, if you think about the, just the very word itself, idol, is you know the word idol, ido, uh, from idon, um, an image, a thing that is seen, the worship of thing that is seen, that is an image. Uh, we are created in the image of God. Our bodies are created in the image of God. And so when a false image is held in our hearts um, as God, then the true image of God will be misused. I think that's probably one connection that one could make there and understand that because, because idolatry involves worshiping a false image of God, the true image of God will then quickly be misused thereafter. The true image of God being, uh, in part, the, the human body, which is created in God's image. We don't know entirely what that means, except that ultimately it's Jesus who's the true image of God, who became flesh, who became a body, and dwelt among us. Um, but, but perhaps another way of looking, well, let me just pause there. Do you have any thoughts on that, Pastor Johnson? Just on that particular way of understanding the connection between idolatry and, and sexual yes. immorality. Yeah, no, I think that's really helpful um, because like you said, it, it, it is abusing, uh, dehumanizing a person when that immorality mm -hmm. could be because when when sexual immorality happens, you're, you're making an idol of the other person really um whether it's in the form of uh yeah. adultery or in, or in the form of prostitution or pornography i mean ultimately it's making an idol out of the in, in a sense you're kind of worshiping that person and getting your jollies off of them uh, but you're using them to a means to an end and um fi yeah fundamentally all sexual immorality is at the root idolatry well and yeah i mean that you could have spent a lot of time on this actually i don't know if we want to but uh when you think of the human community of course is ultimately finds its its genesis in the sexual union of man and woman i mean everyone on earth has a has a man has a has a father and a mother whatever kind of families we come from we all come from different families and and um and god works through works good through all different kinds of of situations in which we find ourselves but um you know everyone has a as a father and a mother and so the sexual union becomes sort of an entry point for the for the human race into the world and um and therefore it's it's sanctified it, it, it's it's a it's a portal of life for us and there and sanctified by the um um, sixth commandment, uh, you shall not commit adultery. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where God protects it. And so if we exchange the God of life for a God of death, then of course the portal and entry of life is going to be um, corrupted very soon thereafter as well. Perhaps another way of looking at it, another uh, connection to make. But then finally also, I think when we remember that, that the, the, um, mission of the true image of God, the true idol of God. And I'm using that term in a positive sense there, and according to its like more original Greek connotation. Um, the true, the, the mission of the true image of God, Jesus Christ, is to be uni united with his believers uh, in, a, in an intimate bond, which is not sexual, but it's still, it's a union. It's an intimate bond and union as expressed perhaps most clearly in the Holy Supper, where we receive his body and blood. And so it also makes sense that where a false God is worshipped uh, and a false supper embraced, then there would also be a false union that would then thereafter follow. And that um, the, the true union that's at the heart of life would be all messed up. So it's just, I just those are just some reflections on this passage here. We're kind of working backwards through this section of um, why, why sexual morality should be so quickly and frequently associated with idolatry. 
And I think we just, it, we need to pause now and then and to work through those connections because it's so easy for us just to think these things, think of these things as, well, things that we should not do, things that we should do, just kind of a laundry list of uh, sort of like, if our parents were to say, well, first I want you to dust the living room and then I want you to do the dishes and then I want you to take out the garbage and then I want you to pick up your room. And we don't necessarily stop and see any connection between those things. We can kind of look at God's commandments that way sometimes. And it's important to pause and to see that there is an interior connection between all of the um, aspects and dimensions of the way of life that we are to follow, that the Ten Commandments have an interior organic connection um, and communion with each other is perhaps a better way to put all the commandments have a communion with each other uh, because they all express the, the perfect will of God. So good to pause yeah, and just yeah. think about that. Um, I, this, in this description of God in, like I said, we're working our way backwards in a way, this description of God in verse seven, and then also verse six, Let's just, I'll just read six and seven again. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people, a point of historical interest. That was the verse used for the funeral of Martin Luther. Uh, and, and the man who preached at his funeral preached on that verse. And basically his sermon was that Luther was the angel. I don't think we want to go there necessarily today. I mean, that works in a homiletical way at his funeral in particular. But it shows that this is, uh, it's interesting that, that this angel flies over the world with an eternal gospel to proclaim. And here's what he says when he goes to proclaim something. Fear God. So he's going to proclaim the gospel, the euangelia, which in Greek, which means good news. And when he preaches the good news, he says... Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And we might pause there and go, that's the good news? Is that the gospel? I thought the gospel was that Jesus Christ bore our sins, and he died for our sins, and he slept three days in the tomb, and he's raised for our justification. Now he rules the right hand of God, and he rules there in order to bring us by his you know, tender love to himself and bring us through all this veil of tears and resurrect us and give us a new creation. I thought that's the gospel. Yes, that's the gospel, but this also is the gospel because it means that mm -hmm. God who created the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water, which is a beautiful way to describe the world. Um, all kinds of Old Testament connections there and also just as a kind of poetic description of the world. It means that God who created this world is committed to the, to the justice, the righteousness, the goodness of this world. And he, has, he is acting and has acted on behalf of the goodness of the world. And so fear him because his judgment has come. His judgment is a good thing because his judgment is going to be setting right what is wrong in the world. And, um, and ultimately that is what we see happening on the cross as well. And so the angel could have flown overhead as Jesus is being crucified for us and for our sins and said the same thing, right? Fear God and give him glory because the hour mm -hmm. of his judgment has come. I mean, what, what better description of the cross is there than that line? Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. It has come upon his servant Jesus. And we all stand there, gobsmacked, mm -hmm. staring at the crucifixion of the Son of God. That is the hour of judgment. And it's fallen upon the Son of God. And it didn't fall upon us. So then there's, there's profound gospel here. And so then it follows upon the implication Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. He, you may certainly worship him because now that the hour of his judgment has come, uh, it shows that he has drawn near, uh, that he is acting on your behalf. He is acting for the sake of your redemption uh, in that judgment that falls upon Jesus Christ. And, you know, I mean, we might even get a little bit creative here and poetic and point out that, seeing the springs of water might make us think of baptism, which is the more immediate implication of Christ's suffering for our sake, that we should be baptized into him and receive all the benefits of that crucifixion and that hour of judgment that befell him. So I didn't want to pass over that point. Anything you wanted to say about that, Pastor? Mm -hmm. um, time. Ooh. Yeah, for sure. And uh, well, it's, it, 
one of the things that we, we hear uh, in a number of places in the scriptures is that th this good news of the gospel, yes, even the good news of the gospel will be a means of division. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, we, we, when Mary goes to the temple for purification, Simeon tells her that Jesus will be the cause for the rising and the falling mm -hmm. of many, and the sword will pierce her own soul. Right. Um, as Jesus talked to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, right, we, we have that wonderful verse, For God so loved the world, God loved the world in this way, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Uh, but then we go to verse 18, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already. Um, and so, so the very presence of Jesus is absolutely good news for, for a sinful world. Uh, but what happens... Uh, when when light is sh when light shines on those who are used to working in the shadows, right? They, they they see it as something dangerous and they scatter like cockroaches, right? You shine light on cockroaches, they they just run away. Um, or if you think about it in 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 terms of uh, families and, and what's going on in families, right? A family can be so used to some dysfunction, uh, like an addiction to gambling, alcohol, whatever, and, and they just kind of get used to that. But then here comes something good where this person is confronted and they're now they're sober now they're not addicted to whatever they were addicted to and and that just shakes the whole family because they're so used to dysfunction and now here comes some 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 truth again and some purity and some holiness and and they're just so used to that and this is this is kind of uncomfortable we, we were kind of used to the way things were and now here comes someone who their, their life has changed and we're not quite used to that. Um, so the gospel is is definitely a cause for fear because, uh, you know, when, when Jesus comes into this world, he is not going to leave this world the same, right? He has come to change it, to transform it, to bring forgiveness and bring mercy. And, and that can be scary uh, for a sin, uh, a sin shadowed world. When we're so used to doing what we want, when we want, however we want, and Jesus says no more, we, we, we get a little worried about that. Um, so yeah, just sure. a very um, important way to understand that. First. Yeah, Psalm 130, there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Uh, mm. There is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Because if there weren't forgiveness with you, why would he pay any attention to you at all? Uh, if there isn't the yeah. possibility for for change, if there's the possibility for newness of life, why would we pay attention at all? But, but since there is, well, then we do attend to you. We fear you. We regard you with awe um, and trembling, even. <laughs> really good point. And, you know, it reminds me of something that Brother Pastor said a couple months ago when I met with him. And he said, um, you know, people are so, he, he, in his particular congregation, he had been facing this sense that, you know, people were were so frightened by the prospect of discipleship, by the prospect of seeing their lives changed as a result of being a member of the body of Christ. And so it's good to remember that that is the case. It's also good to see the last few verses here, here that, that everything that we've just talked about, that everything we've just said has been issued in Revelation as a call for the endurance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And so this is, uh, this is all given to help us endure. This is not given to dispirit us or cause us to despair or to leave us in uncertainty, but it's rather to ground us in the certainty of God's decision to save you and therefore to endure in that faith that God intends good for you, that God intends salvation for you. Therefore, endure in that faith, abide in that faith, or as we see in verses 13, verse 13, I guess, uh, rest in that faith. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. And uh, you know, their deeds follow them. It's kind of an interesting, when one imagines little, little ducks following their mother or something across the streets, um, all the good works of the saints following them like little ducklings uh, into eternal life. Uh, meaning that uh, we also are the, we are the good works of Jesus. We follow him like little ducklings after their mother. And, uh, and then all these works he's given us to do come as well. That, that, that there, nothing is in vain, as St. 
Paul says in First Corinthians, at the very end of First Corinthians 15, your labor in the Lord is yeah, not yeah. in vain. It will follow you. It will abide into the new creation. And, and will the, way, the works we do now on behalf of the new creation will, will issue in their fruit and their harvest at that time. And so it's an encouraging word, ultimately, that we receive here. God is on the move to act on our behalf through Jesus Christ for the sake of setting things right. This is a good thing. There's a warning here so that now everybody knows what to avoid. Everybody knows to hold fast to Jesus as the true image of God, to worship the Father and the Lamb and the power of the Spirit as the true God and not to fall into a, a false worship and idolatry. It's well past nine o'clock. Pastor Johnson, any concluding words for us? Um, no, I think if I, if I said anything else, we might draw this, uh, Bible study even longer. So, so maybe we need to, to close. Um, but, but again, mm -hmm. uh, like you mentioned in the beginning to intro introducing everything that again, uh, revelation is meant to bring comfort to God's people. Yeah. There are, uh, powerful images that are meant to, to shake us to our core. Um, especially mm -hmm. life lived without God. Uh, that this this idea and reality, future reality of torment with without Jesus, you know that's um, that's real, and we don't want to we don't want to sugarcoat that at all. I mean, Jesus was the one who talked about hell the most in the Bible, but uh, we'll kind of save that for next week as we talk about the harvest um, for the end of chapter fourteen, because that's just a really powerful image and how God sorts out. Uh, the wheat from the chaff, as Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 13. Um, yep. shall, shall, shall we pray, Good. Pastor? Thank you, Pastor Johnson. You let us pray. Uh, just one final word to our folks who are listening. Uh, yeah. We're just letting people know again that we, uh, what our Christmas times are, just taking the opportunity to do that because, um, you know, it's a busy season and people don't always remember or uh, connect with other means of communication on this. So, Zion will be gathering this Christmas Eve at 3, 5, and 8. Uh, 3 is a simplified version of Festival of Lessons and Carols. 5 is a fuller version with um, some choir singing and, uh, and, and, and bigger sound. And then 8 o'clock is Holy Communion. Then on Christmas Day, also at 10 a.m., we'll be having Holy Communion. Both 8, 8, 8 p.m. and 10 a.m. are broadcast live on WSAU Radio. 50 a.m. and its associated channels. So let folks know, let them know about this study as well. Um, we love you. God loves you more. Pastor Johnson, would you please pray for us? Absolutely. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the vision that you had given to John so many years ago, a vision which endures even until today. A vision which is meant to inspire our faith, lead us to deeper devotion to your son, Jesus the Lamb, who is at your right hand. And so, Lord, help us these days as we slide from Advent to the joyous festival of Christmas, that we may receive many good things from your hand as, and also give thanks for all of your blessings, for friend, for family, but ultimately for your church and for your son, Jesus, he who is the exact imprint of your being the radiance of your glory. Bring us closer to Jesus this day and every day. And it's his, in his holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Johnson. And God's peace be with all of you.